It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to reiterate our appreciation uh, for all of you being here on this uh, gorgeous Saturday. Uh, and <laughs> I should have uh, concealed that. Uh, but uh, it's my pleasure to be here today to talk to you about the role of imaging in patients in your patients with known or suspected uh, prostate cancer. Those of you who uh, take care of men 50 years old and older have either faced or definitely will face a situation like this. A patient with a, an elevator or borderline PSA that is worried about the prospect of having prostate cancer. Before we go into too many details about imaging, I think it's worth uh, briefly uh, telling, uh, discussing how we get here, how we got to this PSA. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the controversies uh, underlying the prostate cancer screening. Uh, we could speak for weeks about that. But uh, in the end of the day, uh, two uh, tools can be used for screening, uh, prostate cancer screening. One of them is the PSA, and the other one is the digital rectal exam. When one of these two, or both of them, are abnormal, uh, what follows is a transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy. So as of today, the current standard of care for the diagnosis of prostate cancer is a prostate biopsy that, as the name implies, is uh, performed under transrectal ultrasound guidance. Uh, this diagram shows you uh, axial cross-sections of the prostate. Uh, you can see this would be anterior, this would be posterior, this is the base, the mid gland, and the apex, with the most commonly used uh, biopsy scheme. So what is it that uh, the person who is doing the biopsy aims to achieve when doing a prostate biopsy? They want to obtain a uh, randomly uh, uh, achieved course from the right base, right, left base, right mid gland, left mid gland, right apex, and left apex, to a total, in this case, of 12 cores. So again, a random uh, yet systematic sampling of the uh, prostate gland. If we are to look at what happens to these patients, so if you get a group of men who have PSA above four and undergoes a transrectal ultrasound guided uh, biopsy of the prostate, what do we uh, uh, observe? So if we get all of these patients, 30% of them will have a positive biopsy, whereas, of course, 70% of them will have a negative biopsy. However, one of the problems is that we know that with the, a third of these 70% of patients who had a negative biopsy, in fact, do have prostate cancer. So there is a decent uh, false negative rate uh, using this approach to uh, diagnose prostate cancer. And why that is? We've already uh, discussed what the current scheme of biopsy is. So if we use a hypothetical example of a patient who has a large, aggressive anterior tumor, it's easy to imagine that in a lot of uh, uh, patients like this, the random cores would never detect that lesion that is there. Moreover, if we look at this group of 30% who do have uh, a diagnosis of prostate cancer, in about 50% of them, we do not do a good job in providing the uh, physician uh, the information uh, in regards to the tumor volume and the aggressiveness of disease being, uh, in, in this case, the Gleason score. So in a half of these 30% who do have a positive biopsy, the preoperative information uh, in terms of tumor aggressiveness is discrepant from what you observe after surgery. And again, why that is, we already talked about why we have so many false negatives. But the understaging or the underestimation of the tumor occurs because you might miss the clinically significant tumor and just find this incidental small volume, uh, low Gleason score tumor that happens to be there. Or you might under-represent the actual extent of disease. Uh, 
what we do want to achieve is this ideal scenario where with as few cores as possible, you have a good represent, you not only detect the tumor, but you also have a good representation of where it's located and how large and how aggressive it is or it is not. So how can we do this with imaging? We can do this with uh, MRI. And why MRI? I know that uh, this has been extensively covered, but MRI provides a superior depiction of anatomy. And I think it's easier for us if we look at a real life example. So this is a real uh, life example, a cross section of a prostate in a man who we knew had prostate cancer and had the, his MRI for uh, the sake of local staging. If I ask you, can you see a tumor in this prostate uh, ultrasound? Uh, I can't. It's really tough for me to see. When you look at the MRI that corresponds to this exact same transverse section of this exact same patient, this is what it looks like. Right? So you don't have to be an exceptional radiologist. <laughs> and that's probably why I chose this area uh, to <laughs> research. <laughs> You don't have to be an exceptional radiologist to find the tumor. Uh, so I think we, I made my point why we should use MRI and why MRI is the best imaging modality for detecting prostate cancer. Uh, a few brief technical considerations that I wanted to go over with you because these are common questions that we uh, get from ordering physicians. The first one is in terms of the patient preparation. Uh, the preparation before the exam is not substantially different from any other MRI of the abdomen or any other MRI of the pelvis. Uh, the two different, different uh, things that we ask the patients are, one, we ask them to not have an ejaculation for the three days preceding the MRI so that we maximize the distension of the seminal vesicles. Uh, and the second one is these patients are recommended a, an a enema, a fleet enema, a couple of hours before the study so that the placement of the endorectal coil is not as uh, 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 uncomfortable. The second thing is uh, the nomenclature. And uh, you will frequently uh, hear us talking about this study as the multiparametric MRI of the prostate. Uh, the term multiparametric MRI of the prostate doesn't mean that it's performed in any exquisite uh, way. It's just the fact that we rely on different pulse sequences and uh, we uh, combine the information from these three different, three, three different post sequences to come up with a conclusion as to whether or not there is an abnormality and how suspicious that ab abnormality looks like. Uh, those three post sequences that we use are usually high resolution T2 weighted images, diffusion weighted images, and dynamic contrast enhanced images. And the third uh, question that we frequently get is the endorectal coil, the infamous endorectal coil that I know Dr. Rofsky briefly mentioned. Uh, and more and more, you will hear about groups not using endorectal coil. Uh, Dr. Pedroza uh, always talks about this, and it's in everyone's best interest to get rid of the endorectal coil. And we do want to get rid of the endorectal coil responsibly, but as of today, there is no solid data that shows to us that we can perform this study without endorectal coil and without missing important information. Uh, we are currently obtaining some data uh, to try to accomplish that goal, but as of today, the standard of care, the best images that you can uh, uh, obtain, and the more information you can provide is with a three Tesla in the rectal coil multiparametric MRI of the prostate. How to order? So we already talked about this nomenclature. Here, if you order an MRI of the prostate for your patient that is coming here and you order an MRI of the pelvis, for the reasons that we already discussed, it's easy for us to figure out that what you intend to obtain is actually what we're talking about today. But if you want to avoid any miscommunication, you would order a multiparametric MRI of the prostate with endorectal coil. Uh, the endorectal coil, uh, patients will always ask about it. Uh, and if you have a chance to discuss this with your patients, it facilitates uh, the entire process. It, it decreases the anxiety. It shows that everyone is on the same boat and that this is the best to be offered to them. What happens after the MRI? So the MRI report is a relatively long report 
but there, is, there are not too many variations that you're gonna get. If the patient has cancer and the, he has come in for a stage and you're gonna go through the uh, indications for MRI, what you're gonna get is whether or not the patient has evidence of advanced local disease, which would be extra capsular extension and or seminal vesicle invasion. If the patient is uh, in the process of being detected with cancer, so it's a, a detection uh, study, you're gonna get an MRI that tells you whether or not there is a suspicious lesion and what is our level of concern with that suspicious lesion. Uh, some institutions vary in terms of which scoring systems they use. You will hear about PIRADS, which is a, a, analogous to BIRADS for the prostate. We here use a Likert score system that goes from one to five, five being the most uh, uh, concerning lesions and one being the most reassuring lesions. All right, so when to order these MRIs? Uh, first uh, and most common indication uh, as of today is the detection of disease. The patient has suspected prostate cancer and this suspicion comes from either an elevated or rising PSA and its variance PSA density, PSA velocity, uh, or an abnormal digital rectal exam and previous negative biopsy. Second common scenario is risk stratification. The patient has a known uh, prostate cancer that would qualify for active surveillance because it's not as aggressive, but you want to make sure that by using that random approach, the uh, current biopsy scheme, you did not miss significant disease. So you perform an MRI to make sure that there is not a, a more uh, aggressive tumor before uh, putting the patient on active surveillance. It's still within the risk stratification scenario, patients that are already on active surveillance and have suspected progression either because of a newly developed abnormal digital rectal exam or because of an unanticipated rise in PSA. You could you'd use the MRI in the same sense as you do for the patients that we just discussed. Staging, patients with known cancer and uh, what you want to make sure is that uh, he has organ confined disease, that there is no uh, contraindication for surgery or there is uh, locally advanced disease but you want to plan the surgery in a way that you uh, will have free margins. And finally, uh, a less common indication is the post-operative local recurrence. So usually these are coming uh, from the urologists or oncologists. It is impossible to talk about MRI without mentioning targeted prostate biopsies because uh, you should be thinking about, all right, you can detect the disease with MRI, but you're still performing the biopsies under ultrasound guidance, and that's correct. So what we can do is we can use a system that fuses the MRI information with the ultrasound uh, as the procedure is being performed. And I'm not going to go into too many details, but uh, a summary of it is when we are interpreting the MRI, we draw the uh, boundaries of the prostate, we detect a tumor here, and we mark that tumor, uh, and that information is uploaded to the uh, biopsy system, and the ultrasound does the same thing. And once it does this 3D model of the MRI, that target that we uh, marked with the MRI is shown on the ultrasound images. And as the uh, person performing the biopsy obtains the samples, you can see those samples in relation to not only the prostate anatomy, but also whether or not you hit the target that you have in mind. And after you have the results, you can enter the pathology data, and in this case, uh, the, the uh, positive cores are shown in red, so you can see that the positive cores are uh, on the left side, uh, sort of like left mid-gland. Uh, you can sort of overlay that on the MRI, and you can see this 3D representation of the MRI. So that is helpful not only for detecting the disease, but also helps them plan the surgery, know exactly where the tumor is, uh, and more and more, we have also the group of patients on active surveillance where you can re-biopsy those areas to make sure that that tumor has not progressed in the interim. And I'm not going to uh, 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 risk uh, losing uh, mine and your sanity going through this flow chart, but it's, it's in your PDF for, for future reference. And it's interesting to go through the potential different applications of MRI in, in a variety of uh, uh, clinical contexts. 
when not to order, just as important as knowing when to order. Uh, of course, when the patient cannot have an MRI, you're not order an MRI of the prostate. Uh, this is also true for anything, right? If you're not planning to do anything about it, there is no reason why you'd order an MRI. Uh, prostatitis, this is something that sometimes is confusing because we do uh, report prostatitis in a lot of patients that we see, but that is there as an incidental finding. We do not see a role of MRI in patients with suspected prostatitis, suspected or known prostatitis. And immediately following biopsy, uh, as expected, when you biopsy the prostate, there is some intraprostatic hemorrhage, and that fresh blood in the prostate causes some challenges for us to not only detect, but stage a, but an eventually known cancer. So uh, it's not an absolute contraindication, but if the situation uh, uh, allows, we would like to wait uh, a few weeks before uh, scanning these patients. So a summary, prostate cancer screening and traditional transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy might overdetect insignificant tumors and miss aggressive cancers. And that, that is something that we want to tackle with MRI and targeted prostate biopsies. The multiparametric MRI of the prostate within the rectal coil has different applications in patients with suspected or known prostate cancer. And in addition to our experience with this, I think one of the differentials that we can offer your patients is the close collaboration that we have with urology. Uh, we're not only going to give you a report saying what, whether or not there is an abnormality, but thanks to a very uh, close collaboration with urology, uh, the best course of action can be determined. And if these patients do need a targeted biopsy, we have the expertise in-house to do so. I would also like to take this opportunity to, I mean, it's, I think this symposium is a great opportunity to not, not only give you key facts and show what we do, how we do, what we do, but also to show that radiologists breathe, we, we exist, uh, we are within reach. <laughs> and uh, despite what other people might say or think, we are always happy to uh, uh, get a phone call from you and it's always, we're always available. So if, these things are always, uh, always, there are always questions that you can think of during the symposium and we'd be happy to uh, address those uh, uh, as they come up. All right, I think we have a couple of questions here. That is all I have. Thank you very much. Uh, do I, should I go over these or? All right, so what is the current standard of care for the diagnosis of prostate cancer? PSA, digital rectal exam, Trans-guided, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy or MRI guided biopsy? Great, so the majority got it right. Uh, transrectal ultrasound guided biopsy is the correct answer. PSA uh, has a role in screening, right? So the PSA never detects cancer. It's the first step before the biopsy. Uh, Hopefully these numbers are going to change in the near future. <laughs> Which of the following is, is an advantage of targeted biopsies of the prostate compared to random transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies? Are they less expensive? The targeted biopsies, are they less time consuming? Are they more sensitive or all of the above? That's a tough one. I, I, I don't think I covered this, so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you guys can have a good intuition. <laughs> <coughs> Great, yeah, that's correct, more sensitive. They're not less expensive, they're as expensive as a, a, a regular biopsy, and they're actually more time consuming because you end up doing the systematic sampling plus the targeted biopsy, so it takes a little bit longer than a, a, a regular uh, a random biopsy. Thank you very much.